now, something bigger. So is QAnon over or just over for now? Was it really just the friends they made along the way? We bring in NBC's Brandy Zdrozny, who covers these corners of the internet uh, and has been doing so for a while. So, Brandy, explain how Inauguration Day and the 23 hours now since unfolded on these chat rooms. What's the deal today? Where does this go? Yeah, our uh, QAnon appearance yesterday started with much jubilation. You know, it was supposed to be the military taking over, execution of their enemies, Trump reinstated. That obviously, like you said, didn't happen. And it devolved really quickly in the chat rooms. We chat rooms we monitor into like deep despondency. You know, people were writing that, you know, Q was a LARP or a live action role play the entire time. People were saying, you know, it's over, nothing makes sense. Um, just saying that they had hope and they have no hope anymore. Um, so the, pe the reactions that we saw really fell into three buckets. You know, the first, like you said, is people are sticking with Q. People are just pushing the goalposts. Now they're saying, oh, they meant the 27th, or it's really the end of the month, or it's really 2025. And you're going to see this. People sort of gathering around the wreckage like they always do. The second thing we're seeing that's really sort of concerning is we're seeing people being recruited from QAnon groups by more extreme groups that have no doomsday date. So white supremacists, for example, are actively recruiting in these channels. And then the third bucket we're seeing is um, people, like you said, just annoyed, kind of fed up, giving up. One of the major influencers that's doing this is this guy, Ron Watkins. And Ron Watkins ran the message board where he posted. He basically threw in the towel yesterday. And um, these yeah. are the groups that I think we have some hope for de-radicalization with. Okay. There might be a chance to offer an off-ramp. Brandy draws me live for us on that. Brandy, thank you much. We want to take it back now to House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who is about, we believe, to potentially make some news here. Remember, she's speaking on a day, the first day that she is no longer the most powerful woman in Washington. That title now belongs to the new Vice President, Kamala Harris. Let's listen to Speaker Pelosi. And get to work to build back better. Today, our nation marks the passing of the 400,000 people that was yesterday, 400,000 people died. But today marks one year since our first knowledge of this pandemic. And what did we learn this morning? We learned this morning that the Trump administration had no real plan for the production and distribution of the vaccine. Just another in a series of their terrible, ineffective, approach to it from the start in denial, delay, distortion, calling it a hoax. And now we find that they don't ha they didn't even have a plan. As we go forward though, we see immediately that Joe Biden has President Biden has put forth a plan to crush the coronavirus. You know what that is? Yesterday he talked about it in his best in his um, executive actions when he talked about wearing masks, distancing, science-based approaches. Today, he'll sign further orders, my understanding is, to use the Defense Production Act to speed up PPP, PPE delivery, uh, to expand testing, treatment, and public health uh, workforce that we need, and to launch a vaccination campaign all of this to more safely open up schools and businesses and prove health equity. Something that the Republicans would just erase from any bill addressing uh, the uh, disparity in treatment and, their, and testing and therefore the disparity in incidence of COVID-19 in communities of color. As we salute these actions, we're getting ready for a COVID relief package We'll be working on that as we go. As you probably have seen, Mr. Hoyer announced that as we work on these issues, we won't be back in session until the beginning of February. Another week, February 1st, is it the 2nd? And, um, but we'll be doing our, we'll be doing our committee work all next week so that we are completely ready to go to the floor when we come back. And then again, the COVID Proposals from the administration build on many of the initiatives that were in our packages all, all along. It's what the people need, what the country needs to crush the virus 
put money in the pockets of the American people and honor our heroes. We're talking largely about executive action, but I just mentioned that one bill, COVID package. We also were pleased to see the president come forward, the administration come forward with an immigration proposal. We we're pleased that in the House, Linda Sanchez will be taking the lead, Senator Menendez in the Senate. It has the basic principles that we've talked about all along, and we'll see uh, what the timetable is on that. Today, we are in session uh, to vote on the Austin waiver. It is a waiver so that General Lloyd Austin can serve as Secretary of Defense. Uh, as I have said, General Austin is a highly qualified and well-respected leader with over 40 years of decorated service. He brings a great understanding of the challenges facing our nation's defenses and the sacrifice of our men and women in uniform and their families. Once the waiver is approved, I feel confident that the Senate will confirm the General as Secretary of Defense. Civilian control of the military is a, not an issue for us. It is a value. It is a principle. And we are so pleased that unlike the Trump administration, the Biden administration not only allow but encourage the general to come and present his views, which is happening right now in the Armed Services Committee. So again, a very happy time. Uh, we are, I'm very proud of our members. Right before I came here, I was in a, a session that was made available for members and staff about the trauma of what happened on January 6th. Uh, I talked about physical trauma, psychological trauma, vicarious trauma, and the rest. When the press came, saw my office and the rest and asked about things that were stolen, glass that was broken, uh, this violation of the property there, I really said I don't that's important. I respect the Speaker's office and the accoutrement of history that is there, but I'm more concerned about the damage that they did to our staff, to our colleagues in the Congress, to the custodial staff in the capital of the United States. That is damage. That is damage that must be addressed. The resilience that we want to convey we tried to do that night by coming right back, opening up the session of Congress, proceeding, proceeding with the business at hand, the counting of the Electoral College votes to ascertain that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris were President and Vice President of the United States. But that was one aspect of resilience. So many members felt their lives threatened. Uh, the uncertainty of it all contributed to the trauma. This is a, something that everyone in the country should take a measure of how they reacted to this. But I just all pray for the resilience that our country is famous for and that our people need to have as we go forward. And that is one other part of that is that we will be in another few days when I'll be talking with the managers as to when uh, the Senate will be ready for the trial of the then President of the United States for his role in instigating an insurrection on the House, on the Capitol of the United States, on our democracy, to undermine the, the will of the people. It's very clear his, has been on this path for a while, but that what, just that day, he roused the troops. He urged them on to fight like hell. He sent them on their way to the Capitol. He called upon lawlessness. He showed a path to the Capitol and the, the lawlessness took place. A direct connection in one day over and above all of the other statements, statements he had made before. So in any event, please, if somebody's asking, I'm not going to be telling you when it is going, but it, we, had, we had to wait for the, the Senate to be in session 
they've now informed us they're ready to receive. The question is, are there questions about how a trial will proceed? Uh, but we are, we are ready. With that, I'm pleased to take any questions. What do you got, Jen? Good morning. You were talking about security here at the Capitol, um, and I know you're very concerned about that. Do you have any evidence, or were you briefed in any capacity about, do you have any evidence, or were you briefed in any capacity about uh, the allegations of reconnaissance tours that uh, some have talked about? And, and if there's not proof to that, uh, you know, some of your members in your side have said that some of the Republican members who were alleged to have given these that deny that they didn't. As, as all of those things, as you indicate, you have to have evidence of what, ha what has happened. Uh, there is no question that there were members in, in this body who gave aid and comfort uh, to those with the idea that they were embracing a lie, a lie perpetrated by the President of the United States that the election did not have legitimacy. These people believed it. They believe the president. The president of the United States, his words have weight. They weigh a ton, in fact. So that's one thing. In terms of what you suggest, everything has to be based on evidence, and that remains to be seen. In that regard, I'm very pleased that we will have an after-action review that will review many aspects of what happened. Uh, if people did aid and abet, there will be more than just uh, comments from their colleagues here, there'll be prosecution if they aided and abetted an insurrection in which people died. But again, as Chad, as you rightfully ask, uh, that is something that you have to collect the evidence for as you proceed, A. B, I'm very excited because you asked about security here, that General Russell Honoré has agreed to uh, take a big view of the security here. We will have an after action review. There will be a commission, all of that. But immediately, uh, actually before the weekend, he agreed to take a look at the security infrastructure, uh, the interagency relationships, the fact that he is so familiar with the capital regional security aspects of it. Uh, we feel and we believe that we are in very good hands with his taking the look that he has and inviting experts in the field to give their views as well. So that's what we... Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Speaker. Um, two things. If you can put any final point on the um, timing for the article, it was on Pete's No? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it'll be soon, as I said. You'll be the first to know. And also, um, you mentioned um, Lieber Schumer becoming the Senate Majority Yes, great um, you, you have worked um, a long time with both Lieber Schumer and Lieber McConnell. Um, what is your advice um, for Lieber Schumer uh, now that he is um, in the majority? I was speaking to Lieber McConnell, who, who let us know uh, yesterday he still sees, um, you know, the, even the Democrats have a sweep of government now with the House, Senate, and White House. Peter McConnell still sees, you know, a, a, an important role for Republicans as, um, a, you know, in, in the So you're asking what advice I would give to Lita Schumer? You know him. I wouldn't think of giving him any advice on how to deal with the Senate. Not at all. Nor does he give me advice on how to run it. Uh, the house. And in dealing with Leader McConnell? The cat. No, well, see, see, again, that's a dynamic that is very different from the house. I would say, though, for both of us, we have a responsibility to find bipartisanship where we can, to find our common ground where we can. We have that as not only a goal, but a responsibility. When we can't, we must stand our ground. That's Thomas Jefferson standing the ground. But it is, uh, if we're talking about what the country needs, the country needs to crush the virus. Whatever, it hasn't happened yet. The country needs to end the economic crisis that we're in. We need to do more to do that. And one way to do both is to help our heroes, our healthcare workers, our police and fire, our first responders, our sanitation, transportation, food workers, our teachers, our teachers, our teachers. They are on the front line 
risking their lives to save lives in some cases and on the verge of losing their jobs. So it's about a case that we make for what the country needs that hopefully we can have a bipartisan agreement. You mentioned unity and the message of unity that yeah. yesterday. Are you at all concerned about moving forward with an impeachment trial to undercut that message and alienate Republican supporters of the president? No. What? No, I'm not worried about that. The fact is, the president of the United States committed an act of incitement of insurrection. I don't think it's very unifying to say, oh, let's just forget it and move on. That's not how you unify. Joe Biden said it beautifully. If we're going to unite, you must remember. And we must, we must bring this in. And it, look, that's our responsibility to uphold the integrity of the Congress of the United States. That's our responsibility to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. And that is what we will do. And just because he's now gone, thank God, that we, uh, we don't say to a president, do whatever you want in the last months of your administration. You're going to get a get out of jail card free because because people think we should make nice nice and forget that people died here on January 6th. That the uh, attempt to undermine our election, uh, to undermine our democracy, to dishonor our constitution. No, I don't see that at all. I think that would be. Uh, harmful to unity. Madam Speaker, a year ago in the context of the last impeachment trial, you said that you cannot have a trial without documents and witnesses. Okay. I'm wondering what kind of trial you'd like to see your impeachment managers put forward. And is that part of what you're waiting for, some kind of guidance from the Senate about how they'll conduct themselves uh, before you send that article over? Well, let me just say this. We were talking about two different things. We're talking about a phone call that the president had as one part of it, that people could say, I need evidence. This year, the whole world bore witness to the president's incitement, to the execution of his call to action, and the violence that was used. So <clears throat> I, I, believe it or not, don't take part in the deliberations of the delivering, uh, making the, preparing for the trial. That's up to the manager. You all witness versus what information you might need to substantiate an article of impeachment based on, uh, on large part on a call that the president made and described as perfect. It was perfectly unconstitutional. This is different, but again, it's up to them to decide how we go forward, when we go forward. It will be soon. I don't think it will be long, but it, but you must do it. What's the status of HR1 right now? HR1 is, uh, the status of HR1 is that it is uh, in, in an exalted position. Uh, we, uh, it is <clears throat> A priority for us. The Senate has S6, I think is what those is, S6. This is very important and I thank you for asking about it because this is really central to the integrity of our government. To reduce the role of big, dark, special interest money in politics. To give more leverage to small donors and grassroots activists to implement what John Lewis put forth in ending voter suppression. That is uh, what January 6th was about as well, voter suppression. And if the list goes on, that is uh, we have pulled out HR 4, which is part of HR 1, the Voting Rights Act, but that's very much a part of the spirit of that. The reason we have doing them separately is H.R. 6 needs to have, and we have provided it with hearings all over the country. Marsha Fudge, now soon to be Madam Secretary, Carrie Sewell, 
John Lewis, bless his heart, when he was here, all were part of establishing that record for HR4, the Voting Rights Act uh, for now. So we're optimistic we're going to surpass both of them, and uh, it will give confidence to the American people that their voice is as important as anyone, uh, that big money, which suffocates the airways, is no longer going to be the order of the day. And I thank John Sarbanes for his tremendous leadership over a long period of time. John Larson was doing it earlier, now John Sarbanes, both of them. And what's important about it is that it, it gives people the hope that, yes, we can have clean air and clean water and address climate crisis because big dark money will not dominate the policy. Yes, we can have gun violence prevention because big dark special interest uh, gun lobbyist money will not dominate uh, the process. We in the Democratic Party have advanced these that have been stopped, as you know, on the other side. Uh, but we hope now that the more the public knows, the better we will be in terms of policy. And I just, I'll conclude by saying something you've heard me say again and again. Public sentiment is everything. With it, you can accomplish almost everything. Without it, practically nothing. Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln. And now that we have the bully pulpit, and the, and the president can explain to public more clearly, because the president has a bigger audience, uh, that uh, the public will know what is at stake, how they can weigh in. And it won't be a question of the press saying, oh, they're both or this, that. No, we're not. That's the thing. We have a very major difference of opinion as to what, how we honor the Constitution. We hope that we can find common ground on it because it's very important. And, and again, I'll further close. Wasn't it beautiful when President Biden quoted what Lincoln, President Lincoln said when he signed the Emancipation Proclamation on New Year's Day? 1865. It was in his soul. It was in his being. And Biden, of course, said what he was setting out to do is again in his soul and in his very being. Thank you all very much. What a difference a day makes. Thank you. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi uh, with a so we see a little pep in her step. Uh, a good Thursday to you, Craig Melvin here. Pep in her step because it is the first full day of the Biden presidency. And things are moving fast. There's a lot that we're following this hour. Again, you were just watching and listening to the House Speaker there. That's a weekly briefing. Uh, she called the inauguration a breath of fresh air. She talked about President Biden's executive of actions, his executive orders. She also talked a little bit about the uh, potential impeachment trial for President Trump. Speaker Pelosi is saying that uh, uh, there's, there's no use to continue to ask that question. When the trial will be, the Speaker said she is not ready to leave.